So it's my pleasure to introduce Anna, who is a colleague in, from DeepMind, where she's a research scientist. Uh, she obtained her PhD at the AEI lab at the Vrij University in Brussels and a master degree at the Oregon State University. Her research focuses on designing principal reinforcement learning algorithms that are able to leverage structure, discover abstractions, and generalize across environments. So as a before, today she will go in to talk about generalization in... Thanks, Anna, for being here. Thanks a lot. Hi everyone. Good morning. Um, yeah, so I'm uh, Anna, research scientist at DeepMind, and um, yeah, and in this lecture, I will kind of use the theme of generalization to bring together different uh, kind of problems and algorithms in re in deep reinforcement learning. And I would like to thank uh, my colleagues Will, Tom, Andre, Diana, and Hado for some of the slide inspiration. Um, so I'd like to start by um, mentioning this short story by Jorge Luis Borges that's called, uh, that's about this boy uh, called Funes, who one day wakes up uh, and kind of uh, has perfect memory. So he never forgets anything and every single moment looks different to him. And so the story kind of explores what this means where um, he might see a dog one minute and then turn away and see the same dog again, but it wouldn't look like the same dog because the angle would be different, the light would be different. Um, and so here's a quote. Uh, his own face in the mirror, his own hands surprised him every time he saw them. To think is to forget differences, to generalize, to abstract. So I feel like this kind of really illustrates how crucial um, generalization and this ability to obscure away details is to uh, kind of everything that we do in machine learning in general. Um, so since I kind of have given the first version of this talk, I guess a year and a half ago, there has been uh, an amazing explosion of work uh, that is kind of a lot more specifically looking at generalization and reinforcement learning. So either kind of trying to um, uh, kind of measure it and quantify it and in, in, uh, figure out what that means, or posing it as the main problem that we're trying to solve. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that's really exciting and there's some really, really cool work there. Um, but in this lecture, we actually, we won't kind of bring together these, these papers, but instead we will uh, use generalization as kind of this lens to view uh, a lot of uh, recent advances through and kind of both problems and uh, algorithms. So without further ado, let's uh, kind of first take a look at this kind of broader uh, RL landscape and what it is that we're trying to do. Um, so a lot of what we do is uh, try to estimate value functions, right? So the value of a state X is this uh, expected discounted sum of rewards going into the future. And thanks to Richard Bellman, we know that it kind of decomposes into this nice recursive equation that a lot of our algorithms are based on. Um, and in tabular RL, this is really a lot of the story. We have some set of states and we try to estimate their values. But of course, the, the world is a big complicated place. And so doing this exactly for every state uh, is not kind of a, a feasible uh, idea and we would kind of find ourselves in the same place as Funes if we tried to do that. And so we need to resort to some kind of approximation. And here I'm showing a linear function approximation where we have, uh, where we basically, we have some set of features that takes this really big world and maps it into a smaller kind of k-dimensional space. Um, and our problem now becomes uh, learning these smaller k-dimensional parameters. And from that, we can compose our values. So let's take a look at what that means uh, kind of geometrically. We have a feature space. Um, we can compute our target uh, from this feature space using the Bellman equation. Um, but then perhaps this target will now be outside of the span of, of, uh, of the space. And so we need to also project it back into this uh, space that we understand. OK. Um, so, so then the question is, where, uh, where are these features coming from? And they could be given to us by a designer who knows the problem, or we could apply some kind of fixed um, 
approximation scheme like tile coding or radial basis uh, functions or something like that. Um, or we could learn the features. And uh, this learning uh, is uh, basically what the, 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 the field of representation learning tries to do. Um, now, what kind of what distinguishes deep RL and what makes deep RL deep RL is the fact that we're kind of trying to learn both the features and the parameters at the same time from the same data, usually end to end. Um, and just to appreciate how much more complicated that makes the problem, let's take a look at this features at this uh, geometry again. So uh, again, we have our feature space and we get our target. Um, but then now when we project it back, there is no back anymore because the feature space has itself changed and shifted. Um, and so we're kind of in the setup where the ground is always moving under our feet and we uh, are kind of trying to find stability. Um, so that's kind of what we're trying to do. And uh, like we said, in all of this, the, the main problem is generalization. What is generalization? It is um, being able to kind of uh, generalize from things that we have seen to things that we have not seen. Now, what does that mean in reinforcement learning? Um, in machine learning, we usually kind of think of this as unseen examples, and uh, the, the problem setting there is a little bit simpler. We have, you know, uh, uh, kind of a sample, like a, a sample and a label. Um, but in reinforcement learning, the problem setting is quite complicated. So let's take a look at what kind of possible things we could want to generalize over. And for that, let's take a look at the problem setting. Uh, so here we have our uh, usual uh, Markov decision process, where <clears throat> which is a tuple of states, actions, transitions, rewards, and a discount. <coughs> Excuse me. And in this MDP, we might want to um, find the value of some policy, or we might want to uh, find the optimal or the best policy. Right. And basically, every single thing on the slide, maybe except for Markov, can be generalized over. Um, so what we kind of implicitly assumed so far, or kind of talked about so far, is generalizing over observations, which is the problem of representation learning. So how do we um, intelligently extrapolate to new observations that we have not seen based on the observations that we have seen? Um, we might also want to generalize over dynamics. So for example, you might have solved uh, your problem, but now there is some new obstacle in the way, and you would like to be able to kind of quickly adapt your policy to this obstacle. Um, or maybe you have trained in simulation and you want to kind of test your policy in the, in the real world. Um, and so you need to generalize to, again, some dynamic variations that you haven't seen. Um, and because this kind of has to do more with doing rather than seeing, um, uh, a lot of this kind of comes down to some form of policy regularization. Uh, at large, right? So have the policy to be general enough that it does not overfit to the particular way that your world is unfolding in front of you. Um, and so actually, in some sense, exploration during uh, in, in behavior can be seen as something that helps us generalize between uh, different dynamics better. Um, or uh, kind of the way that we represent or parameterize the policy itself, uh, it, it can also be targeted towards uh, something like that. So for example, uh, methods that use, um, infer the, for example, parameterized policy with an information bottleneck uh, have been shown to uh, do well at this kind of generalization. We might want to generalize over rewards. So for example, we've solved uh, the task with respect to some reward function. Now we have another reward function. And we'd like to reuse the structure that we already know. Um, and this falls under transfer learning, which is a little bit more general, but it falls under that. Um, we might want to generalize over policies. Um, and this is, again, it's kind of um, two sides of the same thing, right, with the rewards. So it's also a little bit of uh, transfer learning. Some of off policy learning can be thought of this way. Um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah. Uh, or we might not actually know what we're trying to generalize over, right? So we just kind of have a black box new 
task and we want to reuse what we can. Um, and so here are some kind of more black box methods like meta reinforcement learning or what we try to do in hierarchical reinforcement learning is helpful. Um, so in this, uh, in this talk, we will kind of talk about a subset of these. Um, and uh, kind of go into some specific methods that tackle each of the of the categories. And I will kind of, you know, weave them together into a certain narrative, but it's, you know, it's just a narrative and um, kind of I encourage you to keep the big picture in what we're trying to do, what the problems um, that we're trying to solve are. Um, so I will kind of structure it in two parts. Uh, one is uh, generalizing within a task, which is uh, largely ends up being representation learning, um, and then generalizing across tasks. So uh, trying to solve multiple things in parallel or in sequence. So let's go right into the first part. So generalizing within a task, um, and we will talk about uh, the auxiliary task uh, framework, distributional RL, and the value improvement path. Cool. So. Um, so first, let's kind of think about um, what it actually is that determines how we generalize to unseen observations, right? So that's kind of the, the main problem that we're looking at. So here on the right, we have a normal, uh, our normal architecture that takes uh, an observation, passes it through some network, and outputs a value and perhaps uh, a policy. And the first thing is the architecture itself already gives an inductive bias on how we generalize, right? So we know that convolutions kind of prefer symmetries, Fully connected networks have their own uh, biases, sparsity plays a role. Um, and so depending on the task that we're trying to solve, we need to be mindful uh, about the architecture that we use. Um, and then the, the loss actually determines how kind of what gradients are passed and how these numbers are moved around. So we're doing RL. So here the loss is the RL objective, which is this, um, you know, should be discounted sum of rewards according to sampled according to our current uh, policy. Um, and this is kind of it's it's quite a complicated loss actually, right? So the first issue, is, and there's a couple of issues with it. So the first issue is that it could be the case that the problem that we're trying to solve has very sparse rewards. And for example, you only get a reward when you uh, complete the task perfectly. And so when your policy are, is still bad this loss might just give you zero all the time. Um, and the problem with that is that uh, then your feature, uh, both your features uh, and your parameters, but especially the features might collapse to something trivial that would then make it impossible to learn what you're actually trying to learn. <clears throat> and then the second issue is that this, um, this policy that this loss is, uh, these uh, rewards are sampled with respect to, um, is something that we keep improving in the control setting anyway. So it keeps changing, and so the whole thing is quite non-stationary. Um, and it could be said that representation learning, in some sense, tries to kind of remedy these things uh, as, uh, as the main uh, objective. So first, let's uh, look at the first issue and uh, an algorithm that uh, remedies it a bit. Um, so, so there's this idea of auxiliary tasks, which is quite, uh, which is, which is really uh, nice and simple and intuitive. And the idea is that instead of just trying to predict uh, or uh, learn from the reward, we can actually predict, maximize, do whatever to uh, all kinds of different things. Um, so that while the reward is uninformative, we are still learning something. Okay, and the first thing uh, to introduce this was the Unreal architecture. So here we have a picture from that. Um, and the idea, uh, and it works as follows. So uh, we have some actor critic agents and we have some types of auxiliary tasks. So importantly, um, this agent is still acting with a policy that is learned from the reward. So the RL algorithm itself is unchanged. Um, but at the same time, in parallel, um, we are learning to kind of predict or maximize all kinds of different things that are some function of the observation itself. So for example, we may maximize the pixel intensity or something like this. And um, we, so this is, this is nice because it's unsupervised. It does not require any information on the reward. Um, and 
uh, basically what, what this does is while if your reward is uninformative, but we're, uh, but this is happening in parallel to the representation, it helps to kind of learn features that are non-trivial. And we, we, we call this by shaping the representation. Um, and so this, this, this alone works very, very well. So here is a picture um, of the performance on um, Atari, I think, or maybe DM Lab. Um, where so the gray line is the is the vanilla agent and all the other ones have some combination of the auxiliary tasks and we just see how enormously helpful that is. Um, so so the idea is to learn to predict different things, not just reward. Um, it's important that we don't actually have to use these predictions in the RL algorithm itself and just shaping the representation can be very helpful. Um, and I also just want to make a link to um, an older paper that I really like uh, from 10 years ago at this point, which is the Hoard architecture. And there the idea was to kind of uh, learn a bunch of predictions in parallel uh, to build predictive knowledge. Um, and perhaps condensing this predictive knowledge into the representation and into the features is one way to think about it. Um, and then there is another, there, there's kind of another uh, almost orthogonal uh, perspective on why there could be so helpful, because it's not always that the rewards are sparse, right? And here we have our uh, geometry picture again. Um, and there's a hypothesis that perhaps, uh, so this, this whole thing with uh, deep RL and the features always changing, when you try to predict multiple things, then uh, perhaps something happens that um, your feature space does not end up swinging so wildly. You kind of regularize it in a way that you have a more stable uh, ground to learn from. So that was the first part on auxiliary tasks. And now we'll talk about this family of algorithms called distributional RL, which on the surface are quite different, but end up being very related. So, uh, so for distributional RL, so in general, in reinforcement learning, we care about the return a lot. So now let's look at the return as a random variable. So this uh, discounted sum of rewards, but instead of in the expectation, just as a random variable. So what we usually try to do is we try to learn its expectation, and that's the value function. And what distributional RL proposes is to consider other statistics of this random variable as well. So let's look, take a look at what that means. Um, and first here is the vanilla Q learning or DQN um, agent. So here again, we have our normal architecture. And like we said, we're trying to learn the mean of this uh, random variable from this return distribution. Um, using the Bellman uh, target, uh, we, we get, uh, or the Bellman equation, we get our uh, target, and we get some kind of a mean square error, for example, as a loss. And that's the kind of the, the vanilla Q-learning story. Um, now, in distributional RL, we said we also want to uh, learn about these other uh, features of the distribution. Um, and one way to do that is to basically say, I have some range of values that my return distribution can take. Um, I will discretize this range, and for each value, I will consider the probability that uh, my return random variable is less than that value. So we end up estimating these k kind of probabilities instead of uh, the one number. Um, so now we're kind of in the probability space, and the, the so we have to uh, so our loss becomes something like a KL. Um, and by using kind of some distribution magic of projecting and uh, kind of these transformations and the Bellman equation, we uh, can obtain our distribution target and uh, optimize this whole thing again end to end. So that's categorical distributional RL. Um, so that's not the only way to represent statistics of the distribution, and there is um, a kind of there's the inverse, which um, which works as follows. So instead of considering 
uh, the probabilities for each value threshold, we can consider probability thresholds and then estimate the values for those for each of those thresholds. And this is called kind of the distribution quantiles, essentially. Um, so now, again, we are back in value space, and we can actually just do our normal Bellman equation for each of the, uh, of the probability buckets uh, and do mean squared error and learn. Um, and the, uh, the thing about uh, this family of algorithms is they work very, very, very well. So here on the left, we have um, at the time state-of-the-art results from the rainbow. Uh, agent that combines a bunch of uh, improvements in, uh, uh, in in the deep RL agents at the time. Uh, and this, uh, basically the, the, the thing that takes it over the top, this very top line, is the addition of the distribution, uh, distributional stuff. Um, then on the right, we have also policy gradients uh, for which it's also uh, really helpful. So, so then the question that kind of um, was worked on for, for some time is why is this actually helpful? Because again, we actually still only use the mean or the expectation uh, of this return distribution for the policy or for acting. Um, so that part is still the same as it ever was. And uh, one hypothesis is that these return statistics might just be particularly good uh, auxiliary tasks. And this is almost by definition true because uh, the way that we uh, kind of train and use distributional RL is in the same framework as auxiliary tasks, which is we use these predictions to shape the representation, but not in the uh, kind of the update of the policy. Um, and so, now let's kind of take a deeper look at why maybe that might be and uh, take, a, take a small step back uh, and let's and kind of take a look at this uh, thing that uh, Rich Sutton calls the dance of policy and value, which is something that is um, kind of at the heart of uh, any RL control algorithm. Um, and, it's, and, it's, and it's this thing. So we kind of, we have a policy, uh, we learn values for this policy from that, from those values, we improve the policy, learn some new values, and so on and so on, until hopefully we converge at the thing that is the optimal policy. So the fact that this even works in general is actually quite magical. Um, but in 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 deep reinforcement learning, um, this is particularly uh, kind of scary almost because every new policy and value wants its own set of features. So this whole kind of shifting ground is um, uh, happens at every iteration of this. Um, and that's kind of uh, feeds back to that second issue that we that we mentioned. Um, and so there's always this risk that the features will overfit um, to some intermediate uh, stage in this um, in this tree and uh, will actually become unable to represent the future optimal policy. And so, we need to somehow be able to generalize across time uh, as well as everything else. So what does that so what does that mean? And here is um, um, here is this recent uh, paper uh, called the value improvement path. So um, so value functions live in some space uh, that is that is a polytope, and it's kind of uh, the space of all possible value functions with respect to the reward uh, that we are trying to solve. And the question that we just asked is how well can the current representation fit the future values that we're trying to get to, okay? Um, and if we're just learning uh, the values, there's kind of not much that we can say, right? Because in principle, you could have features that just memorize exactly your current value function and has kind of no ambition to generalize to anything beyond that. Um, now for learning auxiliary tasks, um, this, this can help as we saw it could regularize the representation. Um, but it's kind of arbitrary into which direction it pulls the generalization, right? It depends on the set of tasks that you choose. And here, um, 
so here cumulant is another kind of way of saying another reward function that you maximize. <coughs> um, somewhat kind of interestingly, but maybe not that surprisingly, actually if we evaluate uh, any arbitrary set of auxiliary tasks with respect to the reward that we're solving, at least we will have that it lies in the same uh, polytope. So maybe this will actually point to um, a better direction. Another thing we could think about is uh, to kind of continuously try to... Um, what, oh. Uh, to continuously try uh, to accommodate the uh, the past policies that we have learned, and then hope that um, the this direction will kind of point us in the right way. And then finally, what the what the authors do in this paper is they show that maybe distributional um, RL uh, kind of by learning these statistics about the return places our features particularly well on this value improvement path towards the ultimate uh, optimal policy, which is quite cool. And uh, the way that they kind of validate that is by uh, kind of uh, measuring this generalization uh, error, which is um, this plot on the left, um, and correlating that with the actual performance on a task. So here I have highlighted uh, just a, a normal double DQN agent, this past policy thing uh, that we mentioned, um, and uh, the quantile distribution of RL agent. And what we see is the ordering of the methods, basically the lower the generalization methods, the higher, uh, or the lower generalization error, the higher the performance, which is kind of one hypothesis, um, and also that the distributional RL does better than uh, all of the other methods. Cool, so that brings us to the uh, end of part one. And uh, what have we said? So we said that architecture and loss both determine how well we generalize to new observations. The RL loss can be problematic when the rewards are sparse. And so auxiliary tasks suggest to learn about other things, not just the reward, like pixels, features, et cetera. Um, and, and crucially, these things are used just to shape the representation and not for the policy. Distributional algorithms uh, at large kind of suggest to learn about different statistics of the return and not just um, the mean. Um, and they also do not use these predictions to act. So in some sense, the, the performance benefits can be explained as it being a particularly good family of auxiliary tasks. And why, uh, why is that the case? And perhaps that is the case because return statistics are uh, very good at learning features that are on this kind of value improvement path. Cool, so, um, so now part two, generalizing across tasks. And we'll talk about successor features, uh, universal value function approximators, and something that combines uh, kind of those and something else. So first, what is it uh, kind of intuitively, what, what do we mean by general by, by tasks and generalizing across tasks and stuff? So let's say here we have our classical four rooms uh, domain and we uh, have our goal in the red uh, circle. And now we have solved our problem and we have the policy that points to this red circle, right? But now somebody comes in and says, we have a new goal in this yellow circle. So the policy for that new goal would have absolutely nothing to do with the one that we have learned uh, for the red one, but still it's the same environment. So you would hope that there's some structure um, that we have learned that we can kind of reuse in uh, solving for this um, new goal. Um, so, and, and so kind of more um, precisely, what, what are tasks? What, uh, how do we specify them? And um, what do we kind of hope to generalize over? In general, task specification is not necessarily something that's like well um, kind of decided upon uh, in reinforcement learning, but we usually mean something like uh, a different goal state in the same MDP, and this is in the control setting. We could mean a different reward function over the same dynamics and we might want to uh, optimize it or we might want to find the value uh, of it, so control or prediction, um, or a different, or maybe perhaps a different target policy to evaluate, like, uh, like prediction. 
Um, and according to actually the reward hypothesis, which you will probably hear about uh, later today from Dave, all of these can be expressed as reward. But um, sometimes in practice, like a goal embedding or a policy embedding are just easier to specify. Um, and another thing I want to mention is that I, I think um, the notion of task also can, can seem quite artificial uh, because, you know, there are no what are tasks in real life. Um, but we can also think of it as kind of we have this big giant MDP that we have no hope of ever experiencing fully. Um, and, but there is some repeated structure within it and perhaps the structure can be repeated in this uh, way. <clears throat> Um, and so the first thing we're going to talk about is generalizing to new reward functions in the in the prediction sense. So getting the value quickly for a new reward um, in the same uh, in the same MDP. And we'll talk about this thing called the successor representation, which um, actually recently also has kind of seen a lot of validation from uh, from neuroscience. And it seems like there's that's maybe something that. Um, is somewhat fundamental to uh, how we learn about things. So, so what is a successor representation? And this part will, I think, get a little bit uh, technical, so bear with me. Um, so here we have our, um, uh, our normal value function, our Q function, uh, expected discount at sum of rewards. And here we have another value function, <clears throat> which is very similar, but a little bit different. So, so what is different here? So this second value function has a third argument, which is some other state x prime. And instead of this numerical reward, it has this indicator function for every future state xt that basically tells us if that state is the argument state x prime. Okay. So if we didn't have discounting, then this thing would count um, how many times have I visited x prime when I started from x a and followed policy pi. Um, and, and with discounting, it's basically just the same, just the discounted expectation. So, so this can be thought of as, as, this, um, as a measure of how much time we are expected to spend in x prime if we start from x a and follow policy pi. And then it turns out that we can, um, and it's kind of quite easy to see also, um, that we can rewrite um, our normal value function in terms of the successor representation in this way. Um, and maybe that shouldn't be very surprising because um, basically what we have is that the successor representation measures how much time we spend in X prime. The reward tells you how much reward there is in X prime. Um, and we're summing over all the possible x primes. So this measures, basically, if we start from the state xa, how much reward are we expected to collect, which is the value function. Um, and the cool thing, basically, about the successor representation is that it's reward independent. It, it, is, it is entirely summarizing the dynamics of the world. Um, and so if we are suddenly given uh, any kind of uh, number of other reward functions, then we can immediately, and we have learned the successor representation, then we can immediately and quickly um, evaluate um, them and, and get the value with respect to those new rewards. So that's, so that's, that's really cool. Um, but of course, um, it's a little bit, uh, not easy to see how we would represent this kind of x x prime thing if we have high dimensional states and not in a tabular setting. And so that's where uh, a more recent result um, or a more recent uh, kind of algorithm uh, called successor features comes in. And here we have to make some assumptions. So we're going to assume that our reward function is uh, linear in some reward features uh, phi. Um, and uh, yeah, and it's just this linear combination. And then basically a new reward function would be given then by new reward parameters w. Um, so here again, we have uh, our value function. Uh, we can rewrite it by uh, kind of using this uh, assumed uh, decomposition. 
Um, and then due to the linearity of this representation, the linearity of expectations, we can actually uh, factor out the W uh, from, from inside the expectation. And now this, this expectation then kind of becomes um, a measure of some kind of expected cumulative reward features starting from the state XA. So now instead of counting states, we're counting reward features. And that's exactly what we call uh, successor features. So then exactly in the same way as with the representation, um, we can um, now very quickly evaluate any new uh, kind of reward parameter vector W if we have learned the Psi. Um, so then how would we actually learn these things a little bit more in practice, um, where all of these things are estimates? So, um, so, so we have these two parts kind of to learn. W could be given, like I said, but it could also, uh, we might actually just have a normal, um, uh, just normal numerical rewards that we experience. And in that case, we might have to do regression uh, to basically get our approximate reward parameters. And then, uh, and then the successor uh, features themselves, we again learn via RL because they nicely obey the Bellman equation um, and uh, everything that we know. Um, then the features themselves are usually uh, currently assumed to be given, but there's also some ways in which we can learn those. Um, and, and so it's interesting, the way that this thing does generalization, um, it kind of very heavily, you know, we just went through all of that math, it relies on uh, the structure of the MDP and the structure of the value function, and then also a little bit on this kind of linear feature interpolation. Um, so that's kind of one uh, way that this is doing generalization. Um, and then another thing to notice is that everything that we have seen so far is dependent on the policy. So if the policy changes, your successive features or your successive representation changes completely, and we can't use it anymore. So that's so that was so that was successive features. Um, and then in the next part, we will look at kind of more uh, even more different ways of generalizing, and build up slowly, kind of uh, give some ingredients, and then build up slowly to this thing called universal successive feature uh, approximators. Um, and uh, so with successive features, it was evaluating new rewards, and here it is uh, basically anything: rewards, policies, goals, any of the ways that we talked about. So first, let's um, look at this uh, idea called universal value function approximators or UFAs. So what does that mean? Here we have our normal uh, architecture again that takes uh, an observation, passes it through the network and perhaps outputs a value. Now what a UFA does is it uh, takes kind of this embedding of a reward or a goal um, or you know whatever it is that we're interested in generalizing over and also puts that into the network uh, kind of uh, makes that an input to the network and learns this joint representation and uh, outputs a value function that is now a function of both the observation and the task. Um, and we can also do the same for any policy embedding or really anything that we wish. So this is a very different way of generalizing. It does not care that we're doing RL. Um, so it and so in that sense, actually, it's more it's more flexible, but it also puts all of this hard work into the network itself, like how um, basically the network is tasked with learning how different reward functions relate together and everything like this. Um, so let's take a look at some uh, results that they had in the paper. So um, uh, here's Ms. Pacman, and um, the idea was that each of the pellets was kind of treated as a goal, and there's a small set of training goals on the left, upper left, and a much larger set of testicles. Um, and in the first row, um, there's the values as they would be if they we learned them directly, um, and in the second row, it's those uh, learned kind of or generalized with the UFA, um, and we see that they're quite similar. Which is, which is what we want. Um, but in general, yes, so the performance of this really depends on the architecture and the structure of the problem. 
so um, if you have a problem, like if you have a smooth architecture and you have a problem that's like not smooth, then we don't kind of exactly know what this would learn. Um, so then the next ingredient uh, towards our, our, our goal is this thing called generalized policy improvement. So, and uh, assume we have some set of policies from solving previous tasks, and uh, we are given um, a new reward function that we need to maximize. So what can we do? One thing we can do is we can do what we just talked about, which is we can generalize in task space with the UFA kind of parametrically. But then another thing we can do is we can also kind of try to use the semantics of the, of the RL problem uh, a little bit more specifically. And in particular, you know, just be really greedy, basically. So what is, so what is this saying? Um, so here, these values are um, the values of these old policies that we had with respect to the new reward. Um, then we can choose out of those values the best one via the second max. Uh, and out of that best value, we can choose the best action. So it's kind of this double greedy um, algorithm. Um, and so this is this is nice. Again, perhaps unsurprisingly, there's theoretical guarantees that the resulting policy is going to be better than any of the original policies. And um, and this is all very cheap in the sense that we're not actually, as opposed to option one, where we'd have to learn this giant network, we're not actually learning anything. It's just online kind of recombining um, values. Uh, of course, the, the, the max can be unstable and so on, but that's a different kind of question. Um, and so, and so then now we're going to put all of those, uh, basically everything together into the single nice pipeline, um, as follows. Um, so we have some kind so, uh, again, the, the goal is going to be to solve any new, uh, task basically. And we're going to assume that we have this pol this latent space of policies, and we're going to sample some policies in this latent space. Um, and 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 get a um, get get out the policies themselves. Uh, so then we're going to feed these policies to a UFA um, and get a set of successor features. So instead of getting a set of values, we're going to get a set of successor features. Okay. Um, so that's step one. So now we have uh, successor features for many policies. So now we're so now our new reward parameters that we care about come in, um, and we know what to do because um, we already have our uh, successor features, so we can instantly compose them with these new reward parameters and get a set of value functions. Um, and uh, that's step two. And then and then now we have a bunch of value functions that are evaluated with respect to the reward that we care about. And so we can use GPI to, uh, to get kind of the best policy that we uh, can hope for at that moment. And um, yeah, and so it's kind of, it's really cool because uh, there's all these different ways of generalizing all put together into a single pipeline. And actually in the way that the steps are even structured, uh, or, or um, uh, put together, there is kind of the, the lower down you go, the more structure that is assumed. Um, and um, also, but and, and, and that also kind of makes the problem that it's solving easier. So UFA assumes the least structure, but is the hardest uh, and kind of most general problem. Um, so then in the experiments, uh, yeah, so the author has actually kind of um, almost compared these different types of generalization. So in the, the gray lines are uh, generalizing just with the UFA, so none of the other two steps. Um, and we see that that's much worse than um, doing the whole pipeline together, which is the orange and red uh, lines. And, uh, and that's it. So this is the, uh, the end of the road. Um, so we talked about, yeah, I kind of tried to use this theme of generalization to bring together different um, problems that we care about a lot in RL and different algorithms. Um, and yeah, so you can, you know, uh, all these different components of the problem uh, can be generalizing over each of them 
le yields its own kind of space. Um, and then there's, uh, we kind of also talked about all the different ways of generalizing and then that also exists. And there's this kind of trade-off between how much structure you assume um, and uh, uh, kind of assumptions on sample complexity perhaps that, that would be required. And probably it's good to be somewhere in the middle of the spectrum. Um, and then finally, you know, I kind of um, talked about some particular algorithms, uh, but um, you know, the, the field is changing very quickly. So this doesn't mean that these problems are solved by no kind of stretch of imagination, uh, but the problems will probably kind of stick around for a while. And uh, that's it. Thank you for your attention.